Okay. Good evening uh, and welcome. My name is Jean Harris. I am the chairperson of the political science department here at the University of Scranton and I'm also a board member for the League of Women Voters of Lackawanna County. And on behalf of both the League and the University of Scranton's political science department, I welcome you to tonight's program. The League of Women Voters and um, the University of Scranton are nonpartisan organizations, which means that neither organization supports or opposes political parties or candidates. Both the League and the University believe that good government and more just communities are a product of informed, educated, and active citizens. We are here tonight to educate residents of Lackawanna County about the forms of government that they will choose between on May 20th during the Pennsylvania primary. So two main points I want to make sure we start off um, clarifying at the beginning. Um, first, all registered voters in Lackawanna County can vote on the ballot question. Typically in primaries, only Democrats or Republicans participate because those are typically the only primaries that are ongoing. But the ballot question is open for all registered voters in the county. So even if typically you don't participate in primaries, you do have the opportunity to participate in this point to select the government structure that will be in the county going forward. The second point is that tonight's program is educational. The League of Women Voters and the University, the panelists, and myself um, are not advocating for any form of government. We're offering information. We want to make sure that citizens understand the current structure of government that Lackawanna County has, understands how that is different from the proposed structure of government that the study commission has put forth, and we also want to talk a little bit about what the next steps would be after May 20th if the voters approve the change in structure of government. Before I introduce the panelists, I would like to thank ECTV <coughs> for taping this event. Um, and it will be aired on Comcast 19 on local television. And also, it will be available on the League of Women Voters website and on YouTube. And so you'll be able to look back if you have questions. The League's website is www lwvlackawanna.org, and so you can go to that site. Um, so joining us tonight on the panel, we have Tom Baldino, who is a professor from, of political science at Wilkes University. He also is currently on the Luzerne County Board of Elections. He was appointed to that in 2012, and he served on the Luzerne County Home Rule Charter Study Commission back in 2001-2002. Also joining us is Jim Bobeck, uh, an attorney. He also is currently a council member on the Luzerne County Council, and he, um, his ter term started in 2012 and goes through 2016. That's right. And he also served on the Luzerne County Transition Committee when they voted to move, change their form of government. So Jim served on the Transition Committee from 2010 to 2012. And so those are our experts in terms of home rule, optional plans, and what we're going to be going through uh, here in Lackawanna County. So a little history. <laughs> so last May, Lackawanna County primary voters approved the development of a study commission to review the existing home rule charter that had been in effect since 1977 um, and to see if maybe they wanted to propose a change of structure in the government. The voters the same day of the primary elected seven members to the study commission to do the review and put together a proposal. The study commission held its organizational meeting on June 27th, 2013. The study commission held a total of 17 meetings and hearings between June and February. And then in February of this year, 2014, the study commission adopted a report with recommendations for an optional plan of county government. So on May 20th, all registered voters in Lackawanna County will have the opportunity to vote on the ballot question <laughs> um, this is first some uh, resources for information, and we'll, we'll show some inf other resources at the end of the event. So this is where you can find information on this current structure of government, the study commission report as well, and the, um, the laws that are relevant. This is the question that will be on the ballot for Lackawanna County voters on May 20th. So the question reads, shall the executive council optional plan of county government, including recommendations pertaining to optional provisions contained in the report of the Lackawanna County Government Study Commission, dated February 17, 2014, as authorized by the Home Rule Charter and Optional Plans Law, 
be adopted by Lackawanna County. In general, if the voters vote no, then there'll be no change in the county government. The current form of the Home Rule Charter uh, with three county commissioners that was adopted back in 1977 will remain in place. And if the citizens of the county want to make a change, they have to wait five years before they can call for another study commission. So that's if the vote turns out the majority vote is no. If the majority vote is yes, then Lackawanna County will be governed by the chosen optional plan as prescribed by the state code. The new county executive and county council will run for office in the November 2015 election and they would take office in January 2016. So the new form of government would go into effect in January 2016. What I'd like to do um, to kind of set the context is, is have Jim and Tom talk a little bit about um, home rule. What is home rule here in Pennsylvania and how would that um, differ in general? How does that differ from, legally speaking, from what we, the county would have under the optional plan of government? So, gentlemen. Thank you. A home rule, in a sense, what it really is, is number one, it's just a legal term, home rule, basically, that was developed under the home rules and optional plan law. But what it really means is, for the most part, is whoever adopts home rule, basically, you can literally set the rules of how your house is going to be run. The only limitation on that is what is denied to by the Constitution of Pennsylvania. You know, you can't abridge that in any way. You have to maintain that. But the rules that you actually situate for your own county or municipality, you can write those rules. That's the big thing about home rule. That's where it is. There's a lot more flexibility as opposed to the optional plan. The optional plan gives you certain flexibility as well, but there are prescribed options for that, what you can choose. Um, and the way that works is there is still a state code, meaning state code is what was adopted by your state lawmakers. They have adopted a code that applies to counties. You want to change that state code. You can't do it on the county level. You have to work through your state legislators. And that code applies in all cases more or less where your optional plan uh, does not speak. It sort of fills in the gaps, basically. And that's really the main difference here uh, that happens. Yeah, I also <clears throat> wanted to do a little more context on us. Just so you understand, I served on a government study commission in 2001 and 2 that proposed a charter, not a home rule charter, not unlike what is being proposed by the current Lackawanna County Government Study Commission. It was not an optional plan. That vote was, that per charter uh, question was defeated by the voters of Luzerne County. Five years passed, in fact, it was almost six, and Jim's, um, well, a study commission was formed to re-examine the question of home rule because, and again, I should have started with this, Luzerne County had a traditional three commissioner form of government with traditional elected row offices and all the traditional issues that go with a traditional commissioner form of government in a third class county. So. My study commission failed. We worked two years. We proposed a new home rule charter, which we drafted from scratch. Right? Um, five years, six years later, <clears throat> a study commission was formed. That charter question passed. Jim served on the study commission, I'm sorry, the transition commission that turned the charter language into an actual government. And now he was, and then he was elected. I would add then that Thinking about a home rule charter, what you now have is, as Jim described it, you as citizens have a, your own little constitution that you can amend as you wish. You've written the rules. <clears throat> Going to an optional plan, which my group had the option to do when I was on a study commission, and the people who wrote the charter under which Luzerne County is now governed also had the the option of taking, if you think of it this way, going to a shelf and saying, I want that, taking it down and say, this is the new government we're going to have. It's a pre-packaged form of government. This is optional plan C. It's an executive separately elected and a council separately elected. Your study commission was able to tinker with that 
made some modification within the, the permissible limits of the study uh, of the, the optional plan mandate in the state code. Right? And once that's in place, as we'll see, you, the, the voters in Luzerne County will lose some flexibility because there are some things, as we'll find out, that are under your home rule charter that won't be there under your optional plan. So the voters of Lackawanna, not Luzerne oh, County, sorry. will lose. <laughs> That's OK. I'm going to have to be careful. <laughs> um, so what we want to do is kind of now walk through what the changes will look like, the structure of government, and how the changes will occur. So if the vote is no, um, things stay the same. So all voters currently vote for two commissioners every four years. And the top three vote getters among the candidates um, are elected as full-time commissioners, commissioners for a four-year term, um, which assures that both political parties will have representation the way that the election is done. If we move to the optional plan C, the form of government that has been proposed, which is the executive council form, and many, when we're talking about city governments, would recognize it as a strong mayor council form of government, um, given the way it's been structured by the study commission. Um, what would happen then is voters would all, from the whole county, would get to elect one full-time county executive. So this is an executive elected um, based on all the voters in the county. In addition, the county would be divided into seven districts, and each district has to have comparable population in order to assure one person, one vote. Um, and so each district then would elect one council person. So there would be seven council persons, um, each representing a seventh of the population of the county. Um, so t this current structure is one governing body commissioners with executive and legislative powers. The proposed structure would be a governing body with seven members and an executive elected by the citizens. So citizens are, are voting still for just two people, a full-time commissioner and then a part-time council person who will sit with six others. Gina, if I may, one of the questions people ask is why seven? Why seven in the optional plan? When you choose, as Tom said, the optional plan, you you have some options. It's sort of like, look, everyone's getting a hoagie, but, but do you want uh, you know, banana peppers or sweet peppers? Your choices were five, they were seven, they were nine. Those were the choices to start with. So no, it couldn't be 11, no, it couldn't be three. Those were sort of the choices you had to start with, with seven, basically. And one of the other choices you sprinkle on is, as you had mentioned, was districting. That's another choice. In this case, they chose districting. You choose one council member. The, the thought behind that is, wherever I live in Lackawanna County in my district, I know I will have some representation. Um, the thought without large is that some other counties have gone to is that the, the demographics of my county are quite similar, quite frankly, or we want to really uh, just see ourselves as one big unit, more or less. So we don't care where you're from, we just want that. Well, those are some of the choices that were in the optional plan, and that's what they chose. And with the full-time county executive, as Tom had said, there were other choices in the optional plan. There was an optional plan D, which was you could have an appointed county manager by our council. That was not the chosen path. The C was the county executive. Under your current form with the home rule, your home rule now very much in a way looks like your standard county commissioner form. It's what they chose back oh, 30 years ago. That's what they chose to be. It sort of looks like home rule light in some respects. So it could have been a variety of different things. It could have been anything, frankly. But that was what they set up a long time ago, that they would just keep it like that. So um, those are sort of the options. They were limited to certain things. And, but overall, this is what they've chose so far. <laughs> the extent that uh, you described it as home rule light back with your original charter, uh, when I was on my study commission, we invited um, the home rule, a representative from the home rule commissioners down, or down the Luzerne County, and um, that was the minority commissioner. And from Lackawanna from County, you're saying Lackawanna County, right. We invited, and, and it was Mr. Cordero at the time. And we couldn't understand why they, why it, the, the previous home rule charter folks in, in Lackawanna would basically go with home rule light. And, and he basically promoted why their version of home rule was very good. And it was, his main argument was, as the minority commissioner, he had staff and resources that wouldn't necessarily be there under a traditional three commissioner form, which doesn't require that the minority commissioner have much of anything. Right? 
So the other things that um, I would just add, I might disagree with, with Jean, we're both political scientists, on whether I, were, I would characterize the executive, ex elected executive under this optional plan as a strong executive. And the reason for that is there are independently elected row offices under the optional plan, which as a political scientist, I would say fragments the authority of the executive. You have contending forces vying for control of policy and organization and running things. If, you were, if it were truly a powerful executive, that executive would appoint those row office positions, which is essentially what we have in Luzerne County. Right. What, and so, so typically a strong mayor um, would do more appointing than in either system. So the current county commissioners um, we have here, so these are the other elected officials. So this system, in both cases, we have what's called a plural executive system. So citizens, in addition to electing the county commissioners in the current structure and the county executive and a county council member in the proposed structure, in both cases, citizens elect um, eight or nine other people to the executive branch. And each of those other officials listed here have a specific responsibility in the executive branch, that is to check what's going on with the commission and with um, everybody else who's actually implementing policy. So the fact that currently in the, in the structure there are um, those elected officials, they would remain in the proposed structure. We'd add um, another, the pathonotary, we can talk about that in a, um, a second. Um, so that's why, and, and I agree, um, because of all these elected ex other executives in the executive branch who are there to check the government officials, um, it's not as strong. We do, though, in the new system, the elected executive will have a, a veto power that um, gives some strength um, as opposed to a elected executive that had no say in legislation. So we'll, we'll get to the legislative powers. Um, so this is the executive, the plural executive system where county residents get to elect a multiple, multiple folks to the executive branch. And that is the same in the proposal other than the additional position of prothonotary. And one of the big things with that is really when it comes down to the executive and the independent row offices, and by independent I mean they're elected, what your executive will be able to do is, with your council approval, from by a majority, is they approve a budget. That is the budget that then goes to these independent elected row officers. However, the big difference is, let's say if they were appointed, appointed by the executive, obviously they're going to have to live with their budget because, quite frankly, they may not be in their job very long if they're outside of it. But number two is they have to fall in line with whatever the executive's priorities are, basically. They have to be together. Now, the argument, the counter argument, obviously, with elected is they are hamstrung to a degree by their budget, but that is it, frankly. So register of wills, what do they do with civil documents, judicial records for the most part, that's a lot of criminal filings. Um, let's say mm, these are some of the things. We want to cross-train our people among the offices. You don't have to do that. Even if your executive demands, requests, you don't have to do that with the independent because, again, ultimately you retain office uh, control. Um, and again, one of the reasons people do want that is they think it promotes a check and balances. Uh, well, the executive is giving me a budget which I cannot live for. They're asking for things of which are uh, completely against good public policy. I don't want to do them. My check is I'm not going to do that. Uh, but again, there's always this balance of versus a point at which is things can move. Sometimes appear to be a little more efficiently, mainly because you're all under one roof and you sort of have to follow the line. And, and that's sort of the balance I think that some of the uh, study commission members were balancing with here as well, trying to, trying to find which one works best in practice. And in this case, um, so we still have in the county elected executives um, in both current and what the proposal is. The difference is that Prothonotary that would be put back into the list of elected positions. Um, do you want to talk about what the prothonotary is, either of you? Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> prothonotary, what they basically do is, so anyone who wants to file a civil lawsuit, we're talking civil stuff, it all goes through the prothonotary from when you start a lawsuit to when you file for motions, requests for documents. Anything you want to do with a civil lawsuit, it goes through the prothonotary. Um, but your register will says that's exactly what it sounds like, will, probate, things like that. Recorder of deeds deals with mortgages, houses, things like that, transfer. So they do with a, a special set of skills, more or less. So again, the question is, 
when you have an elected person, you will qualifications, uh, which Tom was going to talk about later, is more or less look, you're 18, you're registered to vote, you live here. That's your qualifications for any job to run for something. If it was appointed, an executive can appoint someone based on potentially qualifications. Run an ad in the newspaper. I'm looking for someone who knows about prothonotary, someone who's dealt with these types of records before. And then you can hire on a specific criteria or skill set, which you cannot do for an elected position. You cannot make any further additions to any position. You can't make the controller have to have an accounting degree. You can't do that. It can be really anyone, frankly. So that's really what the Bathon Chair is doing. So that's it's really being added to the mix, basically, with all the other ones, more or less. So. And the reason it's being added is because the state law says it has to be, given the, the form of government that's been mm -hmm. selected. And so mm -hmm. that's why the prothonotary is going back into the mix, although the county had gotten rid of the prothonotary. Did you want to comment on the qualifications? Uh, I could. I, I will add first, though, that um, in, in Luzerne County, the current Home Rule Charter basically did away with the independent elected offices for most of the row offices, not all, but most. But state law requires that functions be carried out. So while we do not have a prothonotary who's separately elected or a recorder of deeds or a clerk of, of uh, judicial records, those, were, those three were consolidated under a, I forget the exact title, uh, uh, judicial administrator. Yes, judicial okay? records. Also. Judicial records, right? So the functions can't be eliminated, but the elected nature of the people who lead those, those operations, that's, that's a decision that is made by the, the study commission. Um, following up on Jim's point about qualifications, under state law, the home rule, uh, if, if the, as you may, whether you vote for it or not, if you vote for the optional plan, the optional plan requires those who stand for office to basically meet citizenship requirements. And, and, and not, I'm sorry, not citizen, voting requirements. Mm -hmm. 18 years of age, residency, things like that. Can't be a felon necessarily. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, but the, the uh, and, and so as Jim said, you don't have to have an accounting degree to be a controller. You don't need a medical degree to be a coroner. That's, you can think of that as a good thing or a bad thing. There are pros and cons to all of this. And so at this point, that isn't changing. Currently, they're elected, and they'll continue to be elected. So we still have the same, in a sense, minimal criteria for these elected positions um, at, at, in either system of government. Yeah, so to add to that, it's a good point. So whether you vote for or against it, this is probably not your deal breaker criteria because it's not changing one way or the other. There are a variety of other things, greater differences that are probably going to weigh on you. This this is done at this point. This is not going to make a difference either way. Um, so we can talk now a little bit more about the different responsibilities f for the current commission structure compared to the executive council structure. And so here we talk about legislative and executive functions. <laughs> Um, so here we're talking specifically about the uh, legislative functions of the commission um, and how that compares to the legislative functions under the current structure of government. You want to come? Yeah, this is a great one, actually. This is really where you're going to see your biggest difference. And what your optional plan has uh, offered is checks and balances. That's the biggest thing here. So with your current form, you have three commissioners. And to do anything, you just need two people, basically. You're the same two people who come up with the budget, the draft it. You're the same two people who ultimately pass it. And quite frankly, even though there's three of you, you really don't need that other third person. You just need two people. And while I will candidly admit one of those things that you've noticed is there's something called the Sunshine Law of Pennsylvania. A majority of people in elected positions like this have to do it out in public. Now, one of those things your county commissioners never would say, because we definitely knew this in Luzerne County, was all the offices are usually somewhat together. So it would. It was not intentionally, but it was certainly violated if one council member or commissioner walked into another's commissioner's room, all of a sudden two of them, majority are together. They have recently just decided something they're going for. None of that obviously saw the light of day, basically. There was no meeting. No one saw what happened there. And that's one of the things they say commission form can be more efficient. Absolutely. But it definitely does not have that specter of light shining through in some ways. Now, with what you're going to have is the county, uh, the county executive. His responsibility along his or her along with the county managers you come up with that budget you draft it 
And if that's going to get approved, it's going to have to go through your council. There is going to have to be public input on that, not just because your optional plan demands it, because quite frankly, state law is already telling you you're going to have to have that. So you'll see a lot more light on that process. So if you didn't like sausage being made earlier, well, now you have more chances to actually see it happen. But that's really the great distinction here. That separate check and balance really is a big thing, more or less. There's going to have to be a lot more deliberation before anything is get passed. Um, one of the big things about your plan is that, it's like it almost talked about, but is very significant, is with the C, you have a county executive who then has to have a county manager who, with the advice and consent of your council, is approved. This county manager is really going to be the day-to-day -day person. Think of your county elective. Allegheny County is a perfect example. When Dan Onorado was a county executive, uh, he was an elected official. But he didn't really do the day-to-day. -day. He's really more the CAO, the glad-handing, frankly, who was around the state. He was able to campaign across the entirety of your state while there was a day-to-day -day county manager really doing that stuff. So that's a significant thing of what's going to happen. Here. Whoever that county manager is, is really going to be that person who you hope has the requisite knowledge, expertise, skills to be able to be able to run your county government day to day. Those personnel issues, those administrative issues, those budgetary issues. That's really going to be a staple, hoping to get a good person for that. Because that person's ultimately going to give things to the county executive, who's then going to give it to the council. So that, that's a key uh, difference that you're going to have here. But again, the thinking with the optional plan is, more checks and balances. Let's just separate those two things out for more deliberation. Yeah, I really don't have much more to add to that. The key is the separation of powers. If you have, as, as it is now, three commissioners, you really only need two to do anything. Those two commissioners, they make the laws and they execute the laws. They may not execute them down to the minute detail, but they're making judgments about who gets contracts and things like that. With a council and an executive, the executive can put a budget together, get council to pass it. The council and, and the, the executive can go back and forth. The elected executive is the political face of the executive. And as Jim very well described, it's the manager who should be running the government on a day-to-day -day basis without politics. And, that, and, that, and that's where you're going to get your efficiency in operation. It's someone, and this is one of the things that's interesting, we don't have an elected executive in Luzerne County. We have an appointed manager. And he's very competent, but he, there's no one to take the political heat for the executive. The council, in our case, makes the laws and expects the executive to execute the laws, and he does. But then there's disagreement about things. Let's we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so in, in the proposed plan, the county elected a county executive gets a vote on laws that are made by the county. The, so can approve them or veto them, which would mean they would be sent back to council, and council could reconsider and supersede or override the veto with a, a supermajority vote, the majority plus one. Um, the county manager, who is appointed and has to be appointed with the advice and consent of council, so council has to have input in the hiring of the county manager, um, has no vote, is an advisor, oversees implementation, but does not vote on policy. So only the elected officials are voting on policy. Um, and, and more votes because there's seven members of your council versus the current commission where there's three people voting on policy. That, that's really a big thing. And with that county manager, and we'll talk about later, is if this plan is ultimately adopted, one of the biggest decisions you're going to have is how do we get the best and brightest county manager possible? Now, your county executive with the optional plan is limited to a salary of 90000 One of the big things that we saw is there are people who have gone to school and have worked their entire lives in county administration. I mean, there's a whole professional field of these people. So there are fantastic people out there all across the country uh, willing to give the chance. But the key is how are you going to, if you adopt this, recruit that person? Get that person to come to your county. Want to take over the monumental responsibility that will be part of this because that's really going to be how your government works, how it succeeds, whether or not it does, is going to be largely based on who that person is ultimately. Okay, and so um, moving with still legislation, here we're talking now on the, on the budget um, side. Um, so in the current system, the county commissioners are the elected folks who vote on everything. So they vote. Um, on the budget, on tax rates, um, they oversee administration ultimately, um, they're in, in overseeing contracts and employees. So 
other than the parts of county government that fall under those other elected executives, the coroner and the register of wills, the three commissioners are in charge of everything, including the, uh, the policy making. In the proposed form of government, the executive council form of government, the county executive, as I said, has a veto um, on ordinances, uh, which includes budget, tax rates, and whatnot. So the, the executive also has a vote. Um, but there is a, um, a limit in state code that has to be followed um, when it comes to tax increases. Anybody want to comment on that? What, yeah, one of the interesting things here especially is, so let's say with the, if you vote yes, basically, it says tax increases over 25 mils require crude approval and can only increase up to 5%. Sort of a fake complete. You're already over 25 mils. So that's, throw that out. So let's say the following two, under the commission form, to raise taxes. Your commissioners have to draft that budget. They have to approve that budget more or less within the state confines. With your optional plan, there is an additional layer that's going to be necessary. With your county executive approval, with your council's approval, and with your court's <laughs> approval. It is that third step. That's already a necessity under your new government, even if you go for it. So that 25 mils has already come. It's already been passed. So there's going to be an extra layer uh, especially for taxation, whether or not that gets approved or not. So that's one of the things people obviously always look at, whether or not they want to approve something from a taxation rate, what has to pass before something can go into effect. There's an additional layer with your new government, if it's passed. Is that state court or county court? Which one, the 25? The word court there, what's the adjective? Oh, con no, court of common pleas. You have to go, yeah, the court of, you have to go to those courts to get their approval, basically. Now, oddly enough, your Court of Common Pleas, their budget, a lot of it actually comes from your day-to-day -day county government. So it's always an interesting question of, well, I'll approve this if my budget looks a little better, or, you know, will they know this benefits the whole sort of a thing, but it's, it's something extra that's going to have to be done with your optional plan. So a little bit more on the, on the budgeting process, um, comparing the current to the proposed. Um, so currently, commissioners proposed and passed their budget, um, and under the current Home Rule Charter, there are um, rules and regulations to follow that uh, call for public participation in the process, public hearings and whatnot, um, in the budget process. So the current Home Rule Charter specifies public participation in the budgeting process. Um, under the proposed plan, the county executive will, again, propose the budget, and council will approve or not. <coughs> council does have... Um, authority under the proposed pan plan to make some changes to the budget. Um, and so there's a little bit back and forth on the budgeting process. Um, but the optional plan currently does not include a requirement for public participation in the county budget process. Um, there are sunshine laws, so still meetings have to be held in public. Um, but it doesn't have to be specific meetings for the budget per se to just have hearings as is under the current plan. Um, but again, sunshine laws are still, and open meeting laws still apply no matter what structure that, of government um, is being used by the county. Um, but the county could add um, some participation as it develops the county code. So if the new op plan of government optional plan is adopted, um, there's a lot of other work we'll talk about that has to happen before uh, January 2016 when it would go into effect. Um, and one of those is putting together an administrative code. And so that you could end up having some additional participation in the budget processing process that is not in there at this point. One of the big things about public participating in the budget and process is, particularly for the public, your public engagement, your public participation, it is in many respects only as good as the information that is shared actually by your county administration. Budget is usually hundreds of pages. It's line by line. It's very hard to read. And for the public to actually really be able to decipher all this data and then provide some uh, you know, very erudicious comments doesn't always happen. But that's not their fault. It's mainly because of what you've actually given them. So as she has said, with your administrative code, you can potentially uh, have public comment, you can also go a little bit further. You can just prescribe that. I, we would like a narrative, by the way. We want to know what is the story that this budget is telling. You can add a variety of things with your administrative code. But the public comment is, it's very key. Most people do focus on whether or not you're raising taxes. But 
And for some elected officials, quite frankly, it, the public comment mainly becomes, if any of you are gone, maybe your own commissioner means you sit there, you say thank you very much, and you line up the comments and you keep moving on. Um, not, it doesn't make for great public participation, but again, mainly that is because what are you giving people? Uh, people who have a day job, uh, buy at nights, can you go through this 100-page budget and give us something? But you can prescribe different ways to try to engage that comment a little bit further, and that's where, as Gina mentioned, your administrative code will be essential in the details of how people get information and what's part of your budget overall. And so at this point, there is not, um, some documents would have to be created if the vote is yes to make a change, including an administrative code, maybe a personnel code, maybe a code of ethics. There's all kinds of additional work that would need to be done. We'll talk a little bit about that, the transition that would have to occur between this May of 2014 and January 2016, if we move in that direction um, as a county. Um, a couple of other differences um, in terms of elected positions. Currently, the county commissioners, as we indicated earlier, are elected to a four-year term, but there are no term limits, so they can continue to get reelected if the citizens so choose. Um, the county executive in the proposed structure of government would have a two-term limit, so elected again to a four-year term, but would only be allowed to serve two terms, so a total of eight years. Um, when it comes to city council, uh, county council, sorry, the members um, also would have a term limit. Um, they would be allowed to serve three terms, so four-year terms for a total of 12 years if they were elected consecutively. Um, and so the term limit is, is the real difference here in terms of what um, that might impact um, on the county. Um, the, because of the structure, the way the vote goes, um, and so there's a, a note here. Under the proposed form of government, um, folks would run for office in the November 2015 election for both county executive and, and the council. Seven council persons, seven different districts. Um, what would happen is the five council persons who had the largest percentage of their district vote would win four-year terms. The two remaining council persons who's got the lowest percentage of their district votes, so the bottom two, um, would win two-year terms. So in 2015, if the new structure is in place, seven districts each would elect one individual. Two of those districts would have their person only hold a two-year term. Five others would have four-year terms. So that in 2017, you would have um, elections again I have my little cheat sheet here. Um, and you would elect two people, the two districts that had folks with just two-year terms would again elect, but this time those people would be elected to four-year terms. And then in 2019, the five who were elected to the first four-year terms, those seats would be up for election again. So the idea is you're not going to always elect seven at the same time. So you want to have some, some um, overlap with them. And the, the numbers five versus two is in the state law that allows you to adopt this plan of government. So having five elected for four-year terms initially and two for two-year terms is not something the study commission came up with, but that's what the law says if you're following this model. Yeah, the big thing here is really with, so in, the, in two years you're going to have, if you elect this, you're going to have uh, two new people. The, the rationale really behind this is frankly, to add new ingredients to the pot, not just throw everything out all together. That's sort of what you have now. Your House of Representatives and the federal government, every two years, everyone all over. Let's just see what mixes up. And your Senate, United States Senate, it's a little different. There are staggered, not staggered terms, everyone's six years, but it's at different intervals. So it's a slower change if you're gonna see that. And that's what you'll see with this. You'll have some people who will be staying on longer, some new additions to the mix. Um, we just went in this Luzerne County, we have 11 and those who were the top six folks got to hang on for four-year terms. The next five got two-year terms. So we just had this. And so in our uh, five who are at the bottom, one chose not to run for election. So we already knew there'd be a new person there. And then we had the other four who wanted to run. Out of that, three came back. One did not get elected. And so we had a mix of two new people. Um, so with this, you're not gonna necessarily see the same people potentially coming back. 
Number one, quite frankly, is it's a $15,000 per year salary, no benefits, no pension, no nothing like that, and it's going to be a lot of late night meetings. You actually might see people who don't want to come back <laughs> at, the, at the same time. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But at the same time, you are going to have an opportunity for people to engage more on an election level when you're running for this type of position. So whatever, think about your last commissioner election. For the people running for election now or later, what did they have to spend? Who did they have to engage in for... Uh, local contribution to run an election. It's a lot. In Lackawanna County, it takes a lot of money to currently run for commissioner. It certainly was in Luzerne County. The last time we had one, it was over almost a million dollars. This past cycle with our county council and the people who ran, we had people who spent 500. We had someone who spent 30,000. But ultimately, in the end, a lot of that actually didn't make much of a difference, basically, because people still just kind of relied upon what they knew about certain people. So that's, that's sort of the benefit of mixing the pot up a little bit, and that's it. So you're always going to have that. Some new ingredients, potentially, that you can mix in uh, with this form of government. And it won't be just be a total overhaul one time. It'll be more of a slow progression, one way or the other, on how you add things. And one, one thing I just want to remind people, so the council persons are part-time. Um, the executive that's elected and the manager are full-time positions. And so the study commission, um, lays out what salaries they want for those individuals um, to start with down the road if this was the form of government the, the council and this elected executive could change those but the documents do say that council the part-time council get a salary and no other benefits um, and the county executive does get a benefit package under the proposed plan that's equal to the other county employees council could make adjustments to that but they can't diminish it. So the, the executive, the, the optional plan has some details in terms of salaries um, as well. But the, but the council are part-time, 15,000 a year is what's being proposed for them. For them. Um, and so in, in Luzerne, there's 11 council persons elected at large, part-time. Yes. And then, you know, we don't have term limits. We, we have something a little different. You're elected to have, be allowed to be elected three years in a row but then you're mandated to take basically one term off. But you can come right back more or less a little bit later on. That is a subtle difference. And again, it goes back to anything. Your House of Representatives, there's no term limit. There's nothing in your United States Senate. Your president does. The thinking is always, is it best to have term limits, to have new people in there? Or, boy, we really like someone. We don't want to have this person limited anyway. We want them to perpetually go as long as possible. These are the, the two philosophies that are still battling now 200 years later. They'll continue to be battled. Ultimately, in the end, it, it what works best in practice, and that's when you're setting up a government, that's always hard to tell how that one comes out. So if this, um, if a person goes for two terms, can they, with this program, can they go off a term and then come back? For the count, county executive, no, it's two terms, that's it. Lifetime. Right. Okay. And the same for council, it's three terms, that's it. Okay. So we don't have the same system, so you can't just take a year off and then go back in. So it is a true term limit in that sense. Yeah. I mean, the governor, a lot of governors who have a two-term limit can take time off and come back. It's consecutive. But here, there's no consecutive term terminology in there. So no, it's, it's a lifetime term limit. Um, one of the, the big differences in terms of home rule and the optional plans comes down to um, direct democracy, citizens' ability to propose and vote on law, legislation, or ordinances. And so under the current home rule charter, um, there are mechanisms for both initiative and referendum, which allow citizens, initiative allows citizens to actually get petition, signatures on petitions to propose um, language. Um, referendum means they can kind of call back and have a review of something that the legislature has already approved. Um, the Home Rule Charter talks about recall, but the, the courts have found that unconstitutional, so that's really a non-issue even though the the charter still talks about it, but we don't have recall. Um, under the optional plan, um, there really is no um, initiative or referendum. So citizens don't have the opportunity to propose vote on laws. Correct. <laughs> And important it, difference. it is an important difference, although I gather Lackawanna County has never used its INR uh, option. So if you've never used it, is it that important to have it in the new optional plan? That's for you to decide. Uh, and recall is, has never been an option 
because under Pennsylvania, the Constitution and then court decisions subsequent, subsequent uh, it, it's just not possible. We were, my commission was told that, I'm sure yours was as well, that you just don't bother putting it in. You cannot recall. So just in case you're just looking for something to fully understand initiative and referendum, California with its various propositions, those are initiatives. The citizens initiate the process by getting signatures on a petition. Once the sufficient number is reached, the ballot question is right on the ballot. With a, with a referendum, citizens push the legislature to take up a measure, and then the legislature is forced to deal with it. Okay? There is a, one, one more thought. There, with, with the optional plan, if it's necessary to amend the optional plan, that would be put to the voters as a question. So the voters would have a say at that point. I, I have a quick question here. Um, you mentioned that um, things could be added into the administrative code. Could something like that be added into the administrative code, um, the initiative and referendum? Uh, the administrative code is mm -hmm. like a rules of procedure, like and that's adopted by council. Right? Now, that would be adopted by council, and it would not be put to the voters. Yeah, I mean, you have to remember what the optional plan is. Your default is, again, let's go, Constitution, your optional plans, number two. Number three, state code. State code, again, adopted by legislative lawmakers in Harrisburg. So there is no initiative referendum to change things in the state code. You couldn't do that on a county level. You could do that with home rule, but again, as Tom had pointed out, how many people have truly actually ever used that? Number one, it is hard. It takes a lot of uh, petition signatures to do it. There's some people in Luzerne County trying to do that right now. They want an environmental bill of rights. And we see if they get the requisite signatures. They, with the council can also do that, but again, we put on a ballot. Something very interesting, though, that Lackawanna County has been truly helpful on recently is the United States, or the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. March 26, 2014, they came down what was called, and I'm going to get the name wrong, I apologize, the Polarski decision, more or less. This was when your current commissioners tried to attempt to get four questions on the ballot uh, to change people from elected to appointed, bring them within the commissioner form of government. The question was, they had done it through the initiative referendum process as part of the home rule. This was challenged. This went to your Pennsylvania Supreme Court. They came down with a very important decision that says, although under the optional plan says home rules and optional plan governments can amend their government, they are allowed to use the initiative referendum to change their charter optional plan. It said, if you're going to change the form of government, you're going to have to form a whole new study commission. It was a vital decision because there's been a big thing for whether your optional plan or home rule, whether you can just say, eh, we can tinker around with the edges, basically. Hey, we're going to change that elected official. We're going to change that to an appointed. The Supreme Court has now said that changes the form. Therefore, you're going to have to start a whole new study commission. So there is no shortcut. There is no uh, go past you know, go past go collect two hundred dollars. You're going to have to go the full route. Basically, that's a very key distinction here. What it does is whatever plan you if you do choose the Apple plan, it's going to be a lot harder to change it than you think. You're going to have to go through. Now that adds stability to whatever government that you have. Basically. Keep the current one or the new one. It's going to give them time to really get their feet settled, lay down some roots, and, and move forward. Uh, because it's a lot harder to change it than it used to be, not only a few short months ago. Jim, just, I just need a clarification on that, too. Would that then be also subject to the five-year rule? That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. So, so changes at this point, really, in terms of the form, structure of government, you, you have to kind of go through a five-year cycle. Um, in order to re-question, review, and, and propose something new. So it t gives you some time. And Luzerne County did that, and the second time around, they changed their form of government. Um, so it took them a little bit more time to, to get to that point. Question, does, does the five-year clock start running from the time the study commission was elected or from the time the new government starts or summer? Uh, uh, good question. I think it's from when the government is seated. Yes, so January 4, 2016, add five years. So it's really a lot yeah, more. 2021. Yeah. Um, so just a question in terms of um, at this point, um, anything we we didn't talk about in terms of the structures changes that we should talk about, um, and if not, then the next thing I want to talk about is what happens if there is a yes vote. So then there's this period of transition, and so what has to occur to transition. Um, 
Was there any, anything you think that we missed that we need to talk about in terms of the, the yes, no comparisons of the two governments? There's, to... a, there's a lot of, in that catch phrase, including recommendations pertaining, pertaining to the optional form of government. The study has what they call, which they classify as a restore faith additional provision under subsection 2973, which flows out of uh, the option C, including in there a balanced budget, and a lot of other requirements. I don't see that as addressed at all here. Well, and we didn't, we didn't talk about those because some of them are, are similar to what's in the current structure of government, and we didn't go into all of those details. The document that came out of the study commission, um, there were appendices that added information, and you actually had to look at the home rule charter and optional plan law to look at other things. It wasn't all in one document. Um, we will give you um, people to contact if you have questions, because it wasn't necessarily all in one place. Um, and we could, we could spend about five different hours talking about the differences. And so the goal here was really to give the basic structural differences as a starting point to encourage people to think about this before May 20th. Um, and if you have continue, additional questions, um, this will be shown um, on the league's website, this presentation with the, uh, with the um, slides and on ECTV, there is contact information. So if you have questions pertaining to how the county government currently functions, we didn't go through everything in the home rule either, um, you can touch base with the county's outreach officers. If you have questions about the study commission and what they're proposing, um, we have two individuals that you can contact who can give information. Uh, and so that's the best we can do to, to give the basics that we wanted to give um, in a, a doable hour as opposed to five or seven. I do want to talk a little bit about the transition though. So if indeed the vote is a yes vote and we move from the current commission structure of government to the elected executive council form, what has to happen between May 20th and January 27, 2016, missed a year? So this is a big thing. What happens, we say yes. What is the law of the land? That's the biggest question you have immediately. Well, number one, just remember, is if you vote yes, you're going to have elections in 2015. So your current commissioner form will still maintain the rest of 2014. It'll still be in charge the rest of 2015. That's still in place. Some of the things with your optional plan, what you've chosen, will take care of itself. Who will be our county executive? Well, you'll find that out during your May primary and then your general election November. That gets sorted out. Same thing with your council members. That was different than Loser and County where we were going to have an appointed person. So part of our transition was, day one, we need to have a county manager. So we had to start a whole recruitment process a year beforehand, salaries, et cetera, resumes, get them all in, interview people. You don't have that here. So it's one, let's say this, it's not on your plate, one last thing, that's good. Your council members, not on your plate. Take care of itself through the election cycle. The big thing you're going to have is though, as stated with what you have in this government, Again, we have constitution, optional plan, state code. You've just coming out of 30 years of home rule. Even when January 4th hits, what is the law of the land? And trying to, con trying to figure out what is still in place, what is still not. Major thing with that is, it's not in your current optional plan. There is nothing about the transition committee. My understanding was that was a conscious decision. They did not want that. They said, whatever the elected officials are, when they get elected in November, hey, they're going to have about a month and a half. They can get together, figure it out. Fine. But I will even say candidly, even Luzerne County, we are now two years into it. Those legal questions, boy, they sure still arise. Your transition is not a month and a half. Ours was a year and a half. It goes beyond that. The transition is years. It's years into the implementation of your new government because it's those vital things. Where do we stand legally? So part of what can happen is, even though there's nothing in your optional plan for a transition, if it passes, your county commissioners would know, well, I, things are different as of January 4, 2016. They can get together with maybe some of the people from your study commission. They can form an ad hoc committee. There is nothing against them doing that or anyone getting together to start this process of, number one, sorting out legal ramifications. What is the law? What is not the law? Where do we stand? What do we need to do and what do we not need to do? 
Another thing you can also do with that is you're going to need an appointed county manager. You know who your elected official, your county executive will be on January 4th, but who's the county manager? It is possible if you work with people to start a recruiting process early. So that person on January 4th or when they get elected in November will have a month and a half to go through resumes, meet some people. Some of that legwork can already be accomplished because it takes a while to bring in somebody. You advertise, you wait a few weeks, you bring people in, you interview, you get their background. That takes weeks, months. When a new government starts, you want as little downtime as possible before you can really get your feet running. You're going to need that county manager. These are some of the things your transition can look about. A crucial aspect that never stops is also working with your current county employees. Everyone who's an employee, not an elected official, they're still working. They're not, they're not changing. But boy, let me tell you, in that vacuum of lack of information, innuendos and speculation will arise. Well, you don't have a job anymore. You don't either. Your just job is totally different. You're going to need the outreach. Number one, to make sure these people are part of your new government, ready to go, or at the very least, not impediments. Uh, and the same thing with your public. Even if you past this, it's still not going to be clear what that is. So there's going to be a constant dialogue and outreach that will be essential. That's part of what your transition can do if they set it up that way. And you don't have to wait again for your elected officials to get on board November 2015. You could start that earlier, but any transition is only good as the cooperation you get. Now, when we transitioned, we left our county commissioner form. It was not the most giving of information for that entire year of, uh, well, let's give you the playbook on what we've been doing and here's where you're going to face. That takes a little bit of time. Certainly takes a lot of tweaking, ego massaging, et cetera, to really get everyone to work together. You hope that they do. That doesn't always happen. Um, but hopefully that's, that can happen. People will try to work together to make that happen because, again, it's still a vital process. You're only good on day one is all the preparation you made to happen for day one. So even though you don't have it, in your optional plan, you can still try to plan for something. Yeah, I, I don't have too much of the way, in the way of detail to add because Jim has lived through a transition. I only got to watch it. But if, if you think about it in a, just a more general way, going from if you were to approve your, your new optional plan as a new form of government, you would be basically going from one house to another, and without a transition, somebody would walk up to you and say, here's the keys to your new house, and then you get to go into that door of that new house not knowing what's inside, other than there's a roof and four walls, right? It's like having, another metaphor, it's like having a skeleton without any flesh on it. The transition helps build the flesh. Part of what um, we also need to discuss is that administrative code, because uh, the, the charter, whether it's an optional plan or a home rule charter, is basically a set of theories and principles with some structure. How the structure operates under the rules contained in the charter, whether it's an optional plan or a home rule, those are contained in the administrative code. How do things get done? And the creation of the code could begin during a transition, which is what happened in Luzerne. If there's no transition, then the new council is going to need to do that in cooperation with the county executive and manager, which means that, especially for the employees who are working in county government, they're going to wonder, how do we do this? How do we do our jobs? We knew what we were doing. I mean, there are some basics, like how to buy paper or whatever, but there are some things that are going to be left hanging until you have the transition worked out and then the county, uh, the administrative code. And I, I can't stress, stress that enough. And I think Jim gave you some insight into how difficult it was. Every new government goes through growing, growing pains. And it's very clear Luzerne is still experiencing those growing pains. And I'll just add one other thought. No government, no form of government is perfect. Winston Churchill, quote, Democracy is the worst form of government ever devised by the mind of man, except for all the others, right? <laughs> so, you know, coming from Churchill, that's pretty insightful. Understand then that whatever form you operate under, it's not going to be perfect. It's how much you as citizens invest in your government. The more you, time you invest as both voters and as uh, participant observers, the more likely you'll get a government that's responsive to the needs that you have. If you are passive, you get what you put into it. 
And what I had, I mean, you had touched on balanced budget, which is, it's an interesting thing. I think we have to always remember what is balanced budget. In some respects, that's actually just big PR. Uh, your commissioners pass a balanced budget, and we in Luzerne County pass a balanced budget, but what is a budget? It's just a forecast. It's a forecast of where you're gonna be at the end of the year. And we know the big thing in any balanced budget is what are the assumptions that were built into that? So that doesn't make a difference with whatever your government, because everyone passes a balanced budget, but at the end of the year, it's where their professional assumptions made. Are those revenues matching expenditures at the end of the year? And that's ultimately really the big thing. So that I wouldn't think that would make as much difference one or the other, because you're not gonna see that much change. Um, one of the more interesting things I had for, recently forgot about the transition was there was a pay cycle and it was due, I think, January 7th of our new government. One of the biggest things was people were wondering, am I going to get paid and who's going to be signing that check? And one of the things in Pennsylvania is whoever does sign that check, they're going to have to be bonded. So we had this entire thing in December of getting people bonded, background checks, making sure they're okay, because believe me, people will notice if they're not getting paid as of January 7th. <laughs> These are the subtle things, the little things that make the world to certain people that you don't think about when you pass a form of government, but these are the things that you need to start thinking about, start planning about. And that's really where some of that work can still happen if you do pass this. Just start thinking about these things. Are people gonna get bonded? What do we need to do? Dear Lord, let's hopefully everyone gets paid. And, um, and then what you'll do is spend the next few years having everyone else in the state still call you commissioners, even if you're council members, so. <laughs> We seem to have more contact with more officials. For instance, we, now we only have two officials, but if we were to have several officials along with the executive official that we will be electing, we would, we would be able to reach them more easily. So which one do you think would enable voter participation? When you, compare, when you compare the two systems of government, um, the, the voting, the number of opportunities to vote really isn't changing that much. Um, the difference is, yeah, you're losing initiative and referendum for ordinances under the proposal. However, if you look at the history of the county, citizens have not taken advantage of it. So if you want to talk about how to get more people to participate, it goes beyond either of these forms. And we could, again, have an hour-long conversation about what needs to happen, the outreach government needs to do, no matter the system of government. Um, to get citizens to participate more. And so that, that, that is not relevant um, to either of the forms of government beyond the change in initiative and referendum, which is a big change in terms of the opportunity to have um, propose, th that you're losing the opportunity to propose laws and then vote on them. But again, the county hasn't done that. So we're not seeing citizens to, at this point take advantage of that. Maybe in the future they would now that we've talked about it and they have a better sense of it. Um, at, I, yeah, I think ultimately one of the bigger questions though is what kind of government gets me the best results? And you invited back legal women voters, this is not their opinion, et cetera, so we don't give that. But what I, there are varieties of different governments that have been done all across the country. The council manager form of government is nothing new if you looked in the, in the western part of the United States. It's, it's actually very standard. Same in the south, actually. Or through Pennsylvania, we've always more, Northeast uh, area, have always relied more on the elected officials. So, and there are a variety. A lot of them get good results. They could be the same. It really depends, as she had said, overall on your voter participation. Are people informed? Are they still part of that process? That's one of those things you never know when you pass a form of government. But it's one of these things that you will see with practice and the results. You've seen your home rule in its current form of government in practice for a few years. Um, you have not seen your new option, obviously, in place for a few years. But ultimately, what gets everyone the best results, the best county government overall? Um, could, and that's the question that will be asked forever. Could, and could I, Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'd like to ask a question. Does Luzerne County meet at 10 o'clock in the morning, or do they meet at night? No, one of the things, and this can actually be changed in your administrative code if it's not in here. Our actual, our actual charter stated that one of our meetings per month has to be after 6 o'clock. So the first meeting I ever had as chair of that new council, our meeting was at 6.01. Uh, but the reason is obviously people have a day-to-day -day job. They are usually busy 8 through 5, so there is one meeting per month. If they so wish, they, they can attend. That's not in your optional plan, but it's not something that can't be remedied through your administrative code. Right, and so the optional plan says that uh, calls for at least one council meeting a month. 
Um, that doesn't you could that could be changed to more than one, and it doesn't specify when when they first meet in January. We'll set that schedule, and again, that's not in the current structure, but it could be added. Um, I think it's really important um, to remember that whatever decision is made this May, um, people in five years can rethink it, um, go back or go forward. So yes, even under the optional plan within the state, you still have the right to change, call for a referendum, which is using state written language to put a question on the ballot to voters. 2021. Well, but I'm saying once, once the, no, if, if the vote is no, yeah. it's five years from then. It's yeah. not five years from, so if a no vote, um, the time frame starts. So I do want to, um, we've kind of gone through our hour, so I do want to um, pull this to a close. I think we've covered the pieces that we wanted to cover. So I very much want to thank both Tom and Jim for joining us and sharing their expertise, um, which I think has been very helpful. <laughs> Applause, thank you. <laughs> um, and up here are some of the, oh, I hit the button, I didn't mean to. Some of the sponsors, oh, Andrea, sorry. My technology helper here. Um, I'm not good with technology. I do want to remind everybody that um, this Thursday evening, the League of Women Voters and the Political Science Department of the University, again, are sponsoring debates. Um, starting at 7 o'clock is a debate for the three Democratic candidates running for the 112th State Legislative District. And then at 8.15 in the same location is the debate for the two Democratic candidates running for the 113th. There aren't contested races on the Republican side. That's why there are only Democratic debates. And this is here on campus at the university in the Denaple Center, the Moskovitz Theater, which is up on the fourth floor. So this Thursday, starting at 7. Uh, so I encourage you, if you're living in the 112th or the 113th districts, uh, to attend those events. I also encourage you to visit the League's website if you want additional information on this this evening's event, the candidates' debates will be there. Um, also, sources for where you can go to find out more about the current county structure, as well as the proposal uh, to change that structure. And also, if you might be interested in joining the League, which is a group of volunteers trying to make sure citizens are educated about their governments. Um, and so you also, in your program this evening, on the back page is a uh, membership form. You're welcome to join the League. Um, so for the League of Women Voters and the Political Science Department at the University, we hope this program has helped to clarify um, what it is that Lackawanna County voters are being asked to vote on um, on May 20th, the upcoming primary. I want to remind voters that whether or not you are a Democrat or Republican, if you are registered to vote in the county, you can participate on this ballot question. Um, so I really want to encourage everybody to think about coming out on May 20th and voting. Your vote does matter. Sometimes it is one vote that makes a difference. Um, you do get to decide what form of government Lackawanna County will have moving forward, which is an awesome opportunity in a democracy. Not all people get to do that. Um, and so it is really important to come out on May 20th and vote um, the way you think is best for the county. Thank you. Thank you.